Hello and welcome. This is freaking loud. I didn't expect that to be because normally it's like 300 people in here, so it's not as loud. So I'm not going to speak as loud as I normally do. So um, <clears throat> I got invited here today to talk a bit about uh, public speaking for geeks and also to do a bit of a training after that. So that's going to be half an hour talk now. And then we're going to do a little exercise, which basically means that you learn much more than just listening to me, because most of the time you're playing in reverse, whatever you do in the background there. So um, my name is Chris Heilman, I'm principal evangelist for Mozilla, and my job is right now to explain technical things in a non-technical manner to the whole world, and also to be a mediator between the technical team of our company and the non-technical team, because as geeks we always have this like, oh, everybody in PR is evil, and every manager doesn't understand what we want. So we need translators in between those, and I found that speaking and presenting in public and also in the company and during meetings is one of the biggest skills that developers and, in general, geeks lack. And that's the definition of a geek, more or less. But it's quite interesting to see how easy it is to overcome these problems if you just dare to do it. So the first question you should ask yourself is why present at all? Like, a lot of people go into presenting because their boss tells them to. And, or, like, oh, there's a conference and we need a technical person to tell them something about our platform. And you're like, you're just rooted on the spot. You don't know, you're scared, you don't know how to actually present. You're not the kind of person that wants to do that. So, when you go into speaking, being thrown into the water is one way of doing it, but it's actually scary and it's bad. So, think about it. It will come in your future sooner or later. I mean, sadly enough, the, the work market is that way that as a technical person you can get this high up in the company and then you have to go into management to get more money, to get more power, to get all these kind of things. Sadly enough, I don't know a single company where that is not the case. So our social skills are as important as our development skills. We always think our code talks for ourselves. Yeah. Not so much. And <clears throat> there's a lot of geek barriers to public speaking and I'm going to talk through a, a bit of them right now. And uh, the first one is actually conditioning. We've been suffering bad presentations and company all hands and like uh, keynotes and lectures in universities for years and years. It's an awful, awful thing that we had to go through. And it's not uncommon that you see people falling asleep actually on, uh, uh, in universities and actually doing keynotes as well. I've just been at the um, EclipseCon in Germany and there was basically a few of those speakers that learned in the 80s and basically stood there with 60,000 bullet points on their slides and read them out each and every one to the audience. They're absolutely not necessary as a speaker. They could have just shown the slide deck and that would have been the same thing. And it's actually worse because people reread, pre-read what you're going to say next and then you say it. So you're totally redundant if you do that. And we've been over and over seeing that. And in companies, there's this wonderful idea of a portable presentation. When I get when, when a new technology comes out and I somebody somebody in PR and like, oh there's a slide deck that Jason gave at this conference, here it is, now you know everything about the product. No, presentations are not portable. Your slides should be you, should be your presentation. There's information in them, but you cannot just reuse them verbatim because that's just boring and that's really, really bad because it's not your voice, it's not your tone, it's not you developing the thing so you don't have any connection with it. You just read out somebody else's words. And that's why I drive people crazy because I never give them my slides as a slide format that people that like Office actually send to each other. I just put them out as HTML and say like, here are the notes with it, here's a video of it. It makes much more sense that way because it's not a portable format, but we think it, it normally is. The other thing is something I call cold face bullshit, which uh, brings me back to so one of my past, I used to sing in a punk band, and like all the fans love you, and like, oh, punk, kill the system, because you're 14 and you want to do that, it's really, really good. And then as soon as you get a bit successful, when you press your first 7-inch, oh, they're sellouts now. They're not underground anymore, like, I never liked that band, I never cared for it. It's just like, as developers, we have the same thing. If somebody starts talking in public, or talking to management about what they're doing, we're always standing there like, oh, he's a sellout. He's, look, he wants to be a manager, but he doesn't code anymore. Like our, we, we, we're very excited about people that sit in the corner and write code for three years that never gets released and is beautiful. 
but we're not really excited about somebody who sells our managers that new technology that means for the next three months we can actually do something useful rather than reiterating what we've done the last years. So the whole step of like, oh, you're not coding anymore, it's just painful to me because at the same time we complain constantly that people don't know what we're doing. Oh, my boss doesn't understand what I'm doing, but I'm not going to talk to him about it because that's just wrong, right? So we actually count, we're painting ourselves in a corner as the geeks and then wonder why nobody thinks we're actually uh, communicative people, because we're not, we're not doing it. So starting to present, starting to speak, starting to explain technical things in a simple fashion, it's not selling out, it's actually growing and it actually makes you much more interesting. When I worked with Opera to build the web standards curriculum like 10, 8 years ago or something like that, we wanted to have a documentation to build web development from the very beginning. The very basic stuff, what is a doc type, what is a p tag, what is an array, what is an object. All these things, they've been searching for about 9 months for a writer for that, because all the people who were already big in JavaScript and uh, have written books before, all of them said like, uh, that's too simple, nobody needs that, I don't want to do that. Fact is that not many of those people can explain it in a very simple fashion. It's, it's a different skill set. It's like you don't expect the, end, the reader to understand what you understand. Explaining something in a very simple fashion makes it much more understandable for you as well. So sometimes it's an interesting point to go to your mom and explain her something about that great streaming algorithm you're just working on. And good luck with that. But it's a good exercise. So presenting to developers is always selling. Like, oh, somebody's on stage you want to sell us something. And like, I confuse people to hell, and they're like, well, I'm not going to buy any Firefox products now. And you're like, you can't. It's open source. Like, sorry. Like, but you don't sell things with your presentations. If you do, then you are a dick. Then you are these kind of presenters that bore the hell out of you. Then I mean, these people that we've seen over and over again, and like, that just works. Don't worry about it. Cross browser, totally fine. Like that will never go wrong. Offline, nobody's offline. Everybody's got a retina display. That's why this stuff is great. These kind of salespeople we, we, we have. But a good presenter is a translator. It's somebody who gets people excited about the topic by translating it into their language. That's why if you don't know the audience, like I don't hear, it's actually a very bad thing for, for a speaker. But if you know the audience, you can actually write it accordingly. I write a different talk about uh, local storage for designers than I write for Java developers. Because there are different audiences, they know different things, they need different language. So it's more of a translation skill or getting people excited skill than a selling skill. So, funny enough, people listen when you start talking to them. Like, we can write the coolest emails, the best documentation somewhere on the wiki that goes there and dies. And just basically nobody ever reads that, nobody understands that. But going into the sales team and doing a five-minute talk about a product that might be interesting, or a product a competitor has that might be interesting, and we had something similar two years ago but nobody sold it, is a very, very interesting part. It's a very, very powerful thing to do. So don't expect people to read what you put out. Don't expect people to read your documentation. Talk about it. Get them in there. Go in their face and do something and actually get people excited and then point them to the documentation. We always get like, oh, it was on the wiki. It was on that mailing list. I get about 450 emails a day. Yeah, it was in some of those emails. Good luck for me finding that. But if you come to me and say like, okay, here's what, why I need it. Here's what needs to be done about it. Here's the problem that we're solving with it. Then it gets much more interesting than trying to read a whole thread and getting rid of all the like uh, trolls and spamming and stuff. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture of a kid hearing for the first time in his life. It's like the big contraption there on the side is a hearing aid. And this is the kind of, wow, I get it now. I, this is a new world for me. And I find that on a small scale, Speaking in the right language to people does the same thing. All of a sudden, they understand your problem and they don't, uh, they don't think you're lazy if you don't stay the weekend to fix something that can't be fixed. So, in a company, uh, starting a speaking culture is a very important and sometimes hard step. And I managed to do it in Yahoo back then, and then yeah, in Mozilla it was already there. The good thing with Mozilla is that like, we, we are public in everything, our meetings are public, our mailing lists, so you cannot be a bastard on a mailing list because the world sees. 
So everybody already knows that whatever we do, we broadcast. And it's, uh, it's hard for a lot of companies to get their engineers to start speaking because they're scary. They don't wash and they wear strange clothes and they're in the corner and they talk about computers and stuff. I can't give them uh, the chance to talk to the press. Yes, you can if you coach them the right way. If you trust them, trust comes back. Seeing the food here. I mean, one of your colleagues cooks food and says, like, pay for it. You don't have to pay for it, but everybody does. Trust comes back in a company if you don't keep uh, secrets away from people. So a few tools for starting a, a culture of speaking in a company. One of them is PowerPoint Karaoke, which sounds incredibly silly, but is actually very, very good. PowerPoint Karaoke means you download random PowerPoints from the internet. Like, just have a folder, just did a file search, file type, PPT, do something, download lots of them, put them in a folder. Pick a random person from the team, and then actually make them present the deck for five minutes. It's very powerful if it's mixed with beers on a Friday night or something like that. But it's just incredibly cool because it, it gets people out there. And it has the benefits of almost everything that is festive in Sweden has. It teaches you, first of all, not to be a slave to your deck. It makes you understand that your presentation is the backdrop to your talk. It's not you. If that thing fails, I still would be able to talk to you because I know what I'm going to talk about. This is just the outline that reminds me of what I want to talk about. And every single slide deck should be that. It should, in, it should make a message stronger or more visual rather than just being the message. Don't read out your stuff to people. It also breaks down the initial barrier because everybody can look the fool for five minutes. Like, everybody has to do it. Everybody gets picked randomly of the group. It's not like three people get picked out that have to do it as a hazy ritual or something like that. It's just a matter of doing it. And uh, I've seen the photos of parties here in Sweden. It seems to be that you uh, deliberately make everybody look foolish, so it's actually a party. And that's good. That actually makes the whole thing much easier to grasp. And you get to know what to avoid in your own slides, because when you present something that's awful off the internet, you will remind yourself next time when you make slides not to make these 20 nested bullet point lists and these, these like graphs that don't mean anything. And you start to learn speaking rather than just reiterating. Another thing that people do, they write their slides and they write their talk and then they just speak it and like, um, 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 and then they get stuck and they're, they're like, okay, I don't know what I, what I was saying here anymore. In this case, you just have to speak. You don't know what the next slide is going to be. Find a way to segue into the unknown. And that's a very, very important speaking skill as well, because things crash on stage continuously. Another thing is lightning talks. Um, I introduced them in Yahoo in 2007 or something. Um, 15 minutes each week, five minute presentation, here's a problem we encounter. Some code issue, some infrastructure issue. Here's a solution that we found and applied for five minute presentation and a five-minute discussion if it's a great solution and if it should become a best practice or not. The benefit of that one is, first of all, it's 15 minutes. So when you go to managers, you say, like, I want my developers to start speaking. They're like, no, they're there to write code. What are you talking about? OK, how about every Thursday I get 15 minutes before lunch break? OK, we can do that. So it's a good little start. The good thing about lightning talks and starting at lightning talks as a speaker is that you know your stuff. You already talk about the day-to-day -day work that you're doing at the moment. It's not something random that you have to come up with or something in the future or blue sky high thinking thing. Does he talk about, you talk about a positive experience. You fix that bastard bug. You're really happy that it's actually gone. And you found a solution for something that has been breaking for a long, long time. And you have a fixed time and duration, which means it's predictability. Every Thursday there will be a talk. Okay, I might as well do the next one next Thursday. Not like, oh, but no, not me, not me, not me. I don't know how to get a room. I don't know what to do. There's already a framework in place that actually you can just drop into. And everybody gets to have a go. Everybody starts. And I can safely say that from my team, when I was lead developer at, at, at Yahoo, eight of the people that gave lightning talks are now speaking at conferences. And actually, two of them have written a book. It's just an initial barrier that you have to come across and that you have to overcome and you have to actually break apart. Another thing that I started uh, at Mozilla and other companies are doing that as well now is content re repos instead of a slide repository. 
As I said before, I normally have these slide repositories. If you want to talk about that product, here's the slide deck. That's set in stone. Our, our PR department loves it. You cannot change anything. That's awful. That's the worst thing you can do to a speaker. Because I just stand there and I'm a deliverer. You know, I'm just uh, reading out other people's shit. This is not me. This is just really boring. So instead, I, uh, I call it grab bag in our wiki, where I just have uh, uh, all the topics that we have, uh, a, a two-sentence quick explanation what these things are, a few screencasts that you can use, a few screenshots that you can use, URLs where to find information about that, and go with it. And people uh, put their own presentations together from these pieces of information rather than just changing a slide deck and repeating the same, sometimes mistake, uh, slides over and over again. It makes much more sense because it's actually what we do with code as well. We put little things together into a bigger one. So before you start, that's what the company can do, but you yourself can do a lot of stuff as well. And a lot of it is about just your presence. A lot of it is it's about techniques. And a lot of it is not giving a fuck and just going for it. And that's a lot of people don't are too scared to do that. That's why unconferences are much better than conferences because everybody who goes has to speak, which is really, really sweet because you learn about new people that know their stuff but are just too afraid to talk. And I'm running a uh, evangelist reps program in Mozilla where I coach people one-on-one -on, -one on public speaking and get them out into the world. And a lot of it is just like letting them do it and giving it that little idea that they didn't have, like that little message how to tell a story that was elusive to them. So the first thing, forget about a slide deck. Don't start your talk with a slide deck. That's the fastest way of doing it. If you have to give a talk tomorrow morning, that's probably the only way you can do it. But you should start about what do I want to talk about? What do I see as interesting in that topic? So you have to find excitement about the topic. If you're not excited about the topic, you're going to give an awful talk. You're just going to be like, yeah, this is really cool, and my boss told me to do that, and please do that. You try it out, it's really amazing, and I, I love it, really. It's not going to come across the right way. I mean, you can, of course, you can, uh, you can say, oh, I totally love it, but your body language will lie, and people will see that. You're just this broken developer on, the, on stage that has to tell something that they don't want to. So if the topic is not for you, find an angle that makes it interesting to you. Find a way to actually, why would I ever touch that? If you don't find that angle, I would say you're not going to give that talk. Somebody else should do it. Um, uh, I had this event at um, Future of Web, Web Apps in London, keynote, it's 900 people in the room, American dude who was supposed to give the talk, went sick, uh, got sick, didn't arrive in time. Basically, Chris, go on stage, give his slide deck. I didn't know the slide deck. I, it, it, went, it was all like workflow diagrams of like products that I knew that didn't work and didn't exist. And I was like, okay, these are his slides. Uh, he, I'm not him, obviously. So here's a picture of a kitten. And I showed a picture of a kitten for 10 seconds. And then I started talking about what I, as a web developer, think the technology that I was supposed, supposed to sell makes interesting for people. Five news articles came out of that because instead of just reiterating the things that don't work yet, I just told people what works and where we're going with it. So find that excitement about the topic for yourself. Share the pain and the excitement of it as well. Tell stories. How come that you started using that kind of technology? What problem did it solve? What mistakes were made? What gain came out of it? Tell the story of the product and not just the product itself and say, like, ooh, look, you've got to use this because it's good. It's not going to be good enough. Share how you learned what you tell people. That's a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't know this, I can't give a talk about it. Actually, explaining how you learned a certain topic is a wonderful talk. I wish more conferences had a talk with a designer and the developer standing next to each other, talking to the audience, how they work together and how they reach consensus in what needs to be built. But you never see that talk. It's in design conferences and developer conferences. So the whole how you came to do that and how you tried to understand that and how you learned it might be the same for the rest of the audience as well. Of course, everybody learns differently, but they might not have thought of that idea of learning something new. And success and failure stories are wonderful. Like, like when something went completely wrong and broke on your face and got fixed somehow, it's a really, really good story to have. 
like when we found that a DNS server is not a good idea to be in a control of one person because Yahoo Italy was offline for three days. And these kind of things. When we found out that, uh, uh, that uh, some of the clicks that go through our sites are where you don't expect it, like Yahoo Italy, the most traffic was, was the car site. But it wasn't the car pictures, it was pictures of the girls at car shows. So people can actually look at them and can tell their wife, like, oh, I just looked at cars. This is irrelevant to Yahoo Italy or Yahoo, but it's a story that gets people like, oh, it makes it natural, it makes it human, it makes it more interesting, and then you can come in, and Yahoo has so many users in Italy, and so many there, and here's how our localization works, and blah, blah, blah. Come in with a real story. The biggest thing uh, for developers, and generally for humans, is to start enduring and adoring ourselves. Um, we hate being in public, and we, we, we think everything that when people look at us, is wrong, unless we're a very confident person who think we're awesome anyways and everybody should be like us. And the biggest thing is our voice. Our voice is a very, very annoying thing, because when you see yourself for the first time on video, or you hear a recording of yourself, you don't sound like yourself. You're like, what the hell happened there? The reason is that our head vibrates. So in our inner ear, we sound much deeper than we do in real life. We're actually much more squeaky for other people than we are in our own head. So as your head doesn't vibrate with other people, and as you hit them on the head before you talk to them, but that's not a real solution either, <laughs> you have to get too used to that. You have to start understanding that the person that people see is not the person that you see. It's a different person, and it should be as close to each other as possible, unless you want to be an actor and you want to go out of your shell and be somebody else. But again, if you try to be somebody else on stage, it's going to show. So once a very stupid and goofy trick is putting a cork in your mouth. Putting a cork in your mouth and speaking at the same time until you're coherent, until people can understand you, is a very, very good way to learn the right breathing technique for stage. On stage, same as singing, if you actually breathe, you should breathe here, not here. Because if you speak and, and, and breathe in here, your voice will be gone within two hours. If you do it from here, your voice will be still fine after speaking for six, seven hours, not a problem at all. So putting a cork in your mouth forces you to do the right breathing technique. I mean, Swedish people always tell me that's what Danish sounds like anyways, but it's just a very good little trick to get yourself going there. And it's, again, if everybody does it, it's silly enough that nobody cares. So when you go drinking tonight, maybe have a go at that. Record and playback. Record your own talks. Record your own, do screencasts. Get to know your own voice. Get to know your own uh, your intonation. And listen to the stuff afterwards. I'm recording right now here as well. We're recording on the big one here as so well. It's fine. But um, I'm recording because later on in the gym, when I go back, I will listen to it. And see what I did wrong. And see what I can do better next time. You are your best critic. Because you can be really evil to yourself. If somebody else comes up to you and says, like, that was total shit, you really go into the defensive mode and, like, no, it wasn't. Whereas you listen to it, you're saying, like, oh, my God, did I really say that? <laughs> then it's much better to learn from that because it's much less hurtful. But it's good to have friends as well to point out things to you, to say, like, okay, you should, be doing, should not be doing this, you should be doing that. Projection is what it's all about. Projection means who you actually come across as, not who you are. So, if you're not excited, your audience will not be excited. There's uh, the same thing with training. There's no bad trainees, there's just bad trainers. If the trainers are completely excited about the product, and it shows, the, the, uh, the group will be like, yeah, I don't care, either two hours, I'm gone, it's fine. So, you have to project the, uh, the enthusiasm that you have for the system with your body, with your, with your voice, with your words. And the body thing is a very, very strange one, because people then, what do I do with my body? You see a lot of people like, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to speak like this. This is going to be like defensive. I don't want you guys here. Please go away. And then you got the, like, the American on like happy pill, like, yeah, guys, this is awesome. This is like the whole wavy thing in here. A good measure is like have your hands here, like where they naturally are. Like, the further down you are, you probably are going to be defensive. The higher up you are, the more you are on drugs. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, use your hands. I mean, for us, it's not that Europeans, it's, <laughs> no, we don't. But Italians, you don't stop. 
Spanish people, you can't stop. They just wave their hands for everything, and that's great. That's basically showing that they speak with their body and not only with their head, which is a very, very strange thing for us. But um, when, you, when you see photos of me like that, I'm like, I don't know what I explained there. But it made it more interesting for people. It showed that I want to push it out to them. And not just, that's why microphone like that is bad, because you can only use one hand. But in general, use your body for that and project what you want to be. And that's an interesting point there. If you have children, or legal access to children, um, <laughs> get yourself some children's books and read to them. Read to them in a loud voice. Use different voices for different characters. This is the best training you can get for public speaking. Because you are already, I'm doing silly things here. But the kid's going to love it. You're going to be excited about the book much more and just like, yeah, look at this. The baby long talking, fuck it. Like, next one. So, the kids love that. And you learn how to speak loudly without screaming and to be understood by everybody. Because kids are basically, they're ruthless. They're going to be like, what do you mean? Or like, I don't understand that. Like, the audiences normally are not that, not that honest unless you're in Denmark. Or Holland are quite brutal as well that way. So it's that uh, when I when I worked at radio, what we learned was uh, when you write for radio, you should spark the theater in the head. Is what we call it. Like your sentences should give pictures in people's heads. And with kids' books, that's in, that's already given. The pictures are there, but the kid can actually get more imagination if you give it different voices. If you listen to audiobooks of Harry Potter, for example, and you listen to the one by Jim Dale, which is just everyone the same voice, it's boring. The one by Stephen Fry, he used different voices for different characters, much more interesting to listen to. And Stephen Fry is damn good. So, what about stage fright? What about, like, I don't want to be up there. I'm scared as fuck. There's basically, people will see that I don't look good, that I've got red hair, these kind of things. And... It's a matter of projection again. There's a wonderful talk by Amy Cuddy, um, Your Body Language Shapes Who You Are. And that one has research in it that people subconsciously make decisions by how you come across in the first few milliseconds. Of course, only prejudiced people will use that first impression totally against you, but there is already a preconception. What you project is the first impression that you give, and you cannot stop it. So, she found that people who are powerful have powerful stances, like body stances. So they, all their body language is open. It's inviting. It's people who sit like that on a chair with their legs out. It's people who basically stand like this, proud with their chest out and these kind of things. Whereas people who are not in power or are feeling scared can make themselves smaller. They sit in a chair and like they, they play with their iPhone and like they make themselves much less more presenters or, or uh, vulnerable. Because that way, if I'm, if I'm confident and I stand with my body like this, I can have arrows shot at me and I die immediately. If I'm like that, that might be stuck in here or something like that. It's a very primeval thing that we have, a primeval thing that we want to protect ourselves and we don't want to open up. But the power stance, as she calls it, actually does two things to your body. It lowers the, uh, uh, the chemical that is actually uh, there for anxiety. And it, it gives you a higher testosterone level, which is the power level, the one that's like, I tell you now what I think and you believe me if I do. And what she found in a, a, in a research, which is really interesting, is that you can fake it. And this is the dangerous part, because a lot of American, like, uh, um, I keep hopping on about Americans, English and Germans are the same problem. A lot of motivational speakers and people say, okay, fake it till you make it. Just fake it, be this guy that you want to be, and you will be that guy. And that's bullshit, because you are somebody else. You're actually lying to yourself, and you know it back in your head. You can try as, much, as hard as you can, but it will show, and it will not make you happy. But the way that she says, just uh, by embracing the idea behind it and doing it, just for yourself, you become that person. So fake it till you become it was more the interesting part here. So what she says is like, before you go into a high-powered or uh, high-stress environment, like a job interview, just go to the bathroom and stand proud. And do these, these power stances that you see people do, like stand like this, don't sit in the waiting room, cower up, and 
she tried that with uh, several people. They gave her a job, they could take the job interview, and they told the people to do these, and they told other people to just sit like they normally would, or like do these gestures that people do who are intimidated rather than the ones that are in power. And uh, then they had some judges that basically would say, which one of those would you hire? They didn't hire any of those that didn't do the power stances, but all the ones with the power stance that basically just went this and changed their body chemistry that way, they actually said, yeah, this is a confident person, this is going to be interesting. So you can fake it to a degree, but it's, uh, it's getting better and better the more you do it. I mean, nowadays, I'm still scared of public speaking. If you're not, go, don't go on stage. But uh, I'm not... I'm not really afraid of it anymore. I know I can bring it. I know nothing can go wrong because I've done it so many times. But the same way happens just by starting to use these body language things that are there. And it's simple stuff. Learning from others, of course, is a big thing. TED.com is a wonderful resource where you can watch videos. Again, I'm watching those in the gym or on the train. They're 10 to 20 minute videos and they actually have really interesting stories. And for me, it's great material to send out to other people and say, like, see what he did there, see how he's done that, see how she explained that, see the story that came into here. This is how you become a good speaker, this is how you get an audience. And this is what the test, uh, what the test, this is what the exercise that we're going to do after this is going to be about as well. So I will, I will show you a video, or we will watch a video together, and I want you to analyze what the speaker is doing and then we're going to compare all the results later on and you can learn a few things from that. Go to conferences and share afterwards. Go to conferences. A company who doesn't send its developers to conferences is just evil to me. I think it's part of the normal training program. And don't go there to just get drunk and network. Do something useful with it. Learn something new. Go to the, go to the talk that you don't know, not the one that you already know. Go to the thing that you think is completely bonkers and why would I ever use that? You might get interested out of it. And uh, I made it mandatory that when I sent one of my guys to a training or one of my ladies to a training course, uh, to a conference, they have to give a talk in the company later on about the conference. They have to collect the information that they learned, they have to write down URLs, they have to share with the people in the company afterwards what they learned from a certain conference. Because that one means nobody goes to a conference on a jolly, and secondly, it means we have a nice archive of which conferences were good and which ones weren't. Because that's another big thing. We're just like, yeah, every year there's this conference I want to go to. We never had any sense in using them. There was no point going there. But we just do it every year because we did it every year instead of spending the money on a better conference. The big thing, of course, is do not copy. Um, no, when you go to TED and you see these great talks and you see these great things, it's very tempting to do the same stuff. You know, I'm not going to have an envelope in my hand and say, like, oh, and one more thing. Because that's been done. Steve Jobs did that, was successful with it. Don't copy other speakers. Be yourself. Learn what they do rather than how they do it. And uh, think about how could I use the same trick about it. So um, when we're going to watch the video later of the talk, there's going to be lots and lots of techniques that you find. A lot of them the speaker is not aware of. I get people coming up to me and saying, like, what a great talk, I love how you did this, and I'm like, I did that? Interesting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is subconscious when you do it more and more, but it, it's just a matter of, like, how you come across. Again, that's the difference between me and the person that I project. So uh, I've, re I've written a developer adventures and handbook that actually has a lot of information about this, and it's open source on GitHub, it's in written in PHP, sadly enough, but that's how I did it. And, um, yeah, lots of stuff to read in there as well. It has been translated in several languages as well. There's uh, the Events and Reps Toolkit on the Mozilla Wiki as well. These slides are already online. I'm going to send them out later to you as well. And there's great talks on the Events and Wiki. And that basically is where I watch these talks and explain minute by minute why they're great talks and what the speaker did that makes them great talks that you could use for your own. So... That's all for the presentation, so I thank you very much.